Hi folks, it's been about one year and nine months since I last posted, and this is gonna just be an update on the tank and how things are progressing. Uh, regarding the hardware described in the first video, that's still uh, fairly accurate. I've only changed a couple things and I'll talk about those here in a moment. But if you watch that first video, that's effectively what's driving the tank uh, we're looking at today. So what are those changes? Um, the first thing that happened was one of my Nero three pumps did fail. Um, that happens, it's hardware. However, the company stood by it. I sent it in, they replaced it free of charge and sent it back. So um, I still highly recommend them. I think the pumps are great, very compact, as I said before. That being said, during the holidays, I couldn't help myself and had to try out one of these uh, Ecotech uh, MP10s. They're always recommended. So I put one on the back wall there on the left. Um, great pump, um, good app on the phone. Um, it's working well with the Nero. Now, one reason I did pick that up is due to a few power outages where I normally would power this tank with a little gas generator. I wasn't here for one of them and it went about an hour or so before I could have someone fire that up for me. So I went ahead and picked up the Ecotech battery backup as well, which plugs into that pump. So in the event that something like that happens again, um, at least I won't lose uh, the pump in the tank. And that can push that one little pump for I think 72 hours plus. So more than enough time to get everything else up and going, which would be pretty critical at that point. Um, otherwise, let's see, not shown here, however, I'll just mention it. I also picked up a five stage um, Premium Plus 75 uh, GPD uh, roadie system from BRS. I also got the 8800 booster kit that they sell. And oh man, if you're somebody who goes to the pet store like I used to do to grab water all the time in buckets, that was an absolute game changer. Um, it's so wonderful. Hooked it up on the wall in the laundry room. Water just spills down the laundry out pipe. Super easy. I run it down to a five gallon bucket with a float switch that turns it off. Um, always have a five gallon ready to go to uh, do a water change uh, for this tank or my uh, quarantine tank in the garage. Uh, it's super handy. Uh, don't ever have to worry about any stores being shut down. I get to know the quality of the filters and when they need to be changed. And I, I highly recommend it if you've been on the fence like I was for years. I just kept driving 10 buckets over to the, the store and I'm feeling pretty silly now now to have that hooked up. Um, let's see here. I think that's it. So otherwise, watch the other video and everything else about this sump is exactly as uh, described previously. So uh, just a you know, quick glance there, uh, exactly as we talked about before. So now, what are just a few stories about things that have happened in this tank? Well. Um, number one, uh, once I had it kind of stabilized, you know, I read my articles, I'm online, see what people are talking about. And I had zero nitrates at the time. And some folks were like, Hey, if you're going to have, uh, Kato down there at the bottom, if you're going to have, um, uh, you know, you maybe want your nitrates a little higher. I, I don't even remember the reasons now that made me think I should chase some numbers, but I tried to increase it a little bit. And of course, then the tank became imbalanced and, um, I was uh, trying to fight nitrate for a while. I just, again, keep it simple. I just, every time I try to touch something on this tank, things just go haywire. So that was my first little blunder, was just trying to chase a number that my tank wasn't asking for. Um, the next thing was um, I, maybe I got a little lazy. I, I normally use um, Rod's food with a little dash of Benner Reef. Um, and I just, you know, take that frozen bit melt it in some water and stir it around in there. And I, I just switched over for a while to dry food. It just got so easy to pour a little dry food in each day. I think I overdid it with the dry food and it spiked my uh, phosphates, and, phosphates and nitrates. And so to, to push that back, I, I just increased the, um, the runtime on my refugium and uh, added some more cleaning crew as well. Um, I, I didn't aggressively attack it. I just pulled back on the feeding and, and just gave it time. It probably took a few months. Um, but again, I just, I don't overreact on anything. I want everything to happen sort of slowly and naturally. Um, the next thing that happened was, I think post that, it was just sort of, you know, cascading events as happens with these tanks. Anyone who has one knows, a GHA, um, green hair algae outbreak followed. And it was bad. Um, it really, in fact, this, if you come in here and you look um, where this, uh, the zoas sort of were here. That was a patch of zoa garden, and there's almost nothing left. The green hair was just all over everything in here. Um, 
And so what I did is, again, I didn't want to get too aggressive on it. Of course, I, I plucked anything manually that I could. Then I went and grabbed a lawnmower blenny, um, eight blue-legged hermits, two emerald crabs, because I had to refresh my cleaning crew anyways. So I got some, some natural solutions in there, kept picking at it, kept that refugium. Again, increased the runtime on that refugium. I think it's up to maybe 14 hours a day now or something like that. And um, slowly but surely, probably over three months, I'd say, uh, the green hair eventually pulled back, um, and now it's it's completely absent in the uh, display itself. It's not absent in the refugium. I used to never have it down here. This was just the uh, Chato spinning around, and now it is also home to a thriving GHA um, uh, farm. But I just, you know, I farm that stuff out as it builds up, and hey, that's, that's where I want it. I want it out of sight down below, and, it, and that's fine if it wants to drink up the nitrates and things down there, that's fine by me. So then the other thing that you'll see here appearing in this tank is, I think I get a little cyano on the sand back there in the corner. Um, you know, this uh, this is how I knew my Nero pump broke. I didn't notice for like a week that that thing had gone out on the right side. And and suddenly I see this, uh, this red cyano spreading across the sand bed. And I realized that's a flow problem that that could just be solved with flow. I don't really have to point any chemicals in there. So um, I got the second pump going again, got the water moving better, and that pushed it back pretty good. I got that patch back there because I recently moved my pump around, which has resulted in that appearing and creating a bald spot here in the front of the tank. Um, but uh, and again, I'll just solve that by adjusting those pumps. And I think if I keep the flow good and moving across the sand bed, um, that, that remains a non-issue. So I'm not too concerned about that. Um, let's see, what else is in here? Coral placement. This is probably the biggest lesson for me. I don't know what the heck I was doing. Um, I haven't been in this sport for <laughs> hobby for, you know, 20 years where I've seen every frag grow into something more significant, understand the relationship between the different corals very well. So, you know, I glue my frags in and suddenly they got big. Um, some of them got, you know, some of these things got, you know, really, really big. And so... What's happening now is you end up with these little, uh, you got some border disputes. Um, you got different, uh, different corals bumping into each other and, and doing some harm, which can be seen in a few locations. And so when I find these areas where uh, they're, they're sort of beating up on each other, I'll try to separate them, but there's only so much room in the tank as well. So that's becoming a little problematic, but I will say there is definitely an art to coral placement and knowing what will be compatible and, and Certainly the tank has educated me, um, well, I know I'm not educated. The uh, other thing I'll call out here are these, uh, <clears throat> these plates up here, these manipura that grow out. They, you know, quite the sun blockers. So while they can be very pretty, do be thoughtful about where you put those. Um, we, we talked in the first video about when I was doing my aquascape that I was trying to look from the top straight down to make sure that it wasn't blocking lower sections of rock, uh, so everything could be exposed to the light. Well, I didn't allow for the growth of, of those plates, and they've ultimately changed that dynamic and, and created shady areas that I originally didn't intend for. So they break off easy, and it's not hard to prune them back, but it's just something to keep in mind as you're placing corals in your tank. Um, let's see here. So then we have additives. Well, I guess what I was gonna call out is that I still don't use any. Um, I don't think I have the fastest growing, most beautiful, colorful tank in the world. Um, I also was, it's a fairly inexpensive setup. You know, I've never gone to the high-end Apex stuff and I've, I've uh, never uh, bought a frag that costs more than maybe 30 bucks. Everything is just a frag that's grown up. Um, so it was really hard to design it visually in that sense, but I also have seen some tanks with better color, faster growth, and maybe that would be an additive. I just, I just, every time I touch it, I just, again, I just want to keep it simple. Um, I use my all for reef down there. You can see piped in. You know, that's feeding all my uh, traces and my alk and my calcium and everything, and I'm, I'm happy with the results it gives me. It's very simple. It's just one doser, and, and I, Everything else I try, I feel like I'm gonna shift something else and this isn't broke, so I don't wanna fix it. Maybe it could be better, but I'm pretty pleased with how it looks anyways. Uh, feeding wise, I was just gonna call out. So now what I do is I try to go at least four days a week 
using Rod's frozen food and some Bene Reef spooned in there, or maybe a little Reef chili. Uh, actually, I can come over here. Um, so I would normally be using, um, yeah, some of this uh, Reef chili or this Bene Reef with uh, Rod's frozen food. And then on dry days, I'll run the uh, Hikari and the TDO here. Um, that's basically the food plan. Um, yeah, give them just a turn off the pumps with my uh, phone because uh, they're hooked up to the uh, CASA switches I talked about in the first one. So I just set a 30 minute timer and they turn themselves back on. And I just go under the tank and uh, <clears throat> on my octopus uh, return pump, I can just hit the feeding mode up there on that control box on the top right. That goes down for 15 minutes and then um, that's it. Pour the food in and it, it blows around. I just want to correct what I just said though. <laughs> I said I turned off the pumps. I do not turn off the pumps. I want those blowing the food around the tank. I'm sorry. I turn off the um, auto top off with the CASA controller and set a 30 minute timer to set it, turn it back on. So that's how the feeding goes. Now, uh, I got a few questions down in the comments I can go ahead and respond to. Isn't it difficult to keep the sand clean? If you wanted a white, beautiful sand bed, yeah, that probably would be difficult with this particular structure getting in and around there. That being said, honestly, the areas that are the hardest to reach are actually the nicest in the whole tank because the sun doesn't get there either, so to speak. Um, and then, you know, other areas do stay fine. They get churned up by some of the, uh, you know, fighting conch and things moving around in there. However, I have a very minimal sand bed. I mean, you can see here, we're just blue right off the bottom. In fact, it might get to the point in the future where I just let areas that have sort of hardened and overgrown into interesting natural patterns be the only thing on the bottom of the tank. But for the most part, I'm not worried about trying to keep a white sand bed. Um, I'm, I'm, it's all natural in, in many ways. Um, are you happy with the Octopus Varios 2? Yeah, I mean, it's worked great. Even with the manifold, um, I've had no problems with it. I feel like it turns over plenty of water. Um, so I think uh, that's all been going very well. Uh, UV sterilizer off of one of the valves. Yeah, I'd had a UV sterilizer in here, that, that one of those green machines, I think it's called. Um, it finally failed, um, or it just, it was, it was well past its date, and I didn't replace it. I don't know how much it was doing for me. I used it back in the early days, um, just to remove clouding from the water and stuff when the tank was starting up, but now that the thing is established, I haven't worried about going back to UV, but you certainly could run one off one of your manifolds and it'd be, you know, pretty viable solution for doing that. Um, what are you running your Nero 3 pumps at? So when I had both pumps, I usually run them both uh, on a random uh, between uh, 60 and 90%. The only reason I say 90 instead of 100 is that when they hit 100, then you, they are not silent. You, you can just hear them. A uh, little bit. I mean, it, it, it's quiet, but you can hear them. So I just stay just under that and it still seems fine. There's still plenty of water being pushed around in there. Um, and those have worked great. Um, and then another question about is the system silent? Um, let me see if I have anything else here. Um, I, uh, no, I do not. Okay, so I think that's about it uh, for everyone's questions and, and just to give you a state of the tank. We'll just come down here real quick again. Um, again, nothing has changed, so just watch the, the first hardware video um, for, for how all of this is working. And then some of these frags, if you go back and look, you'll see some of these, these guys from the first video that were just one head and now they're all over the place. So they've done very, very well um, in here. And like I say, probably the biggest lesson uh, for me is, is just coral compatibility and growth and what shape they'll actually take on um, as, they, as they become larger. Uh, maybe that's even something that your local fish store could help you with. Uh, if you take a picture of your tank in and show them your coral placements, maybe using their experience, they could tell you where things are gonna grow in to be, be an issue. So, all right, well, there you go, folks. Everything's working well. Good luck with your tanks and take care, bye-bye.